Mark, we're going to, wherever Mark is, uh, we're going to do Mark first. Is that okay? Okay. Um, to me, I think they're two, in, two incredible people. Um, we had uh, Dr. Mark Hughes, and we had him speak uh, eight, nine years ago, ten years ago, I can't even remember. And um, I, I just, his story was just, to me, very incredible. And everybody really enjoyed his presentation. And um, it's Dr. Mark Hughes, and he is internal medicine? Yes. Internal medicine at Johns Hopkins University. So, oh, we're going to get some tech technical help for you. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy, enjoy his talk and, and uh, just find it incredible as, I, as we did years ago. Colleagues um, just found out that her daughter was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. Uh, and uh, she subsequently started coming to these meetings, uh, said what a great form it was for you all, uh, and then you know, connected me with Pat. Um, but I shared, you know, I, I shared with her that I had had uh, neuroblastoma as a, as a child, uh, and that was a, you know, inspiration for her to see hope. You know, uh, I'm 53 years old now, uh, and had it as an infant. Uh, so the fact that, you know, this was before the moon landing, before Woodstock, uh, that I was treated for neuroblastoma, uh, and I, I'm going to need my reading glasses because I cannot see. I, that's only since age 50 that I need. Uh, so I said, uh, so she asked, no, so tell me, you know, how, how has it been for you? Uh, the radiation treatments knocked out one of my kidneys, uh, so I've got some renal insufficiency. You may have also noticed my odd body habitus uh, with a short torso, uh, longer legs. We heard about that uh, growth uh, effects uh, this morning. Uh, I'm really supposed to be 6'2 instead of 5'8, uh, which is also the result of the uh, radiation treatment to my spine. Other than that, I'm no worse for the wear, dedicated to helping others, since I see my life as a gift as a result of what I went through. I really do wish all of you as well as you go through this roller coaster. Same sentiments for you all. So that's uh, what I'm going to share with you, is the story of uh, my journey with neuroblastoma. I'm going to start the story uh, with my father. Um, today would have been his 97th birthday. Um, so I'm going to get emotional at you know, diff different points. Just just bear with me if I have a shaky voice. Uh, but he was a member of the greatest generation. Um, he died five years ago, uh, but um, went off to war, fought in uh, the, the South Pacific in uh, World War II uh, as a Marine. Um, grew up in the Depression. Uh, he had, uh, his father died uh, at age 48. Um, my, my father was only age two at the time uh, from a medical mishap. I won't go into the details of that, but. Uh, a medical error caused uh, my, my grandfather's death. Uh, and this is at a time when my grandmother was pregnant, six months pregnant, with their third child. So in the midst of the depression, uh, she's needing to raise three kids. Uh, my father started working at age nine. Uh, and then, you know, when the war came, uh, joined the war. That's my grandmother uh, with him. Uh, and um, that greatest generation, you know, did amazing things, uh, not only uh, you know, fought the war, but came back home, um, uh, settled down. Uh, they created the baby boomer generation, uh, which I'm sort of the, the tail end of. Uh, and um, in that, you know, after post-war, he was on the GI Bill, um, got his uh, both college degree and law degree, uh, then met my mother, uh, who was a secretary at the law firm, uh, where his sister was also uh, working as a secretary. So they married, uh, settled down, uh, they moved uh, on, onto Long Island, I'm from New York originally, and started having the baby boomer family. So uh, if you, anybody knows Levittown, um, uh, Levitt home, Homes uh, built, you know, organized communities for all these GIs uh, after the war. Uh, so this is a few years before me uh, with my five siblings, uh, and then a couple years later I came along, 1966. Uh, and uh, so, uh, in that year, um, my father celebrated his 44th birthday, uh, and just that same month, August, uh, we decided to move out further east on Long Island uh, uh, to our, my childhood home. Uh, and, um, you know, big family, six kids, needed a bigger home. The Levitt homes, if you're know, familiar with those, pretty small, people built on them over, over time. Uh, but 
uh, after that move in, in August, decided, well, I'm gonna go up and take the family to Vermont, uh, visit my, my, this is my father, uh, school age friend uh, that he'd known for you know, all his life, had a bed and breakfast up there. I was told that during that whole trip in September, for that whole vacation, I screamed as a you know, seventh month old, uh, nonstop, couldn't console me, something was going on. Um, come back, um, I start vomiting, uh, regurgitating, not keeping my food down, uh, seen by my uh, family doctor. Uh, they feel a palpable lump in my abdomen. Um, they don't have CT scans, they don't have MRI scans, they don't have much means of uh, investigating uh, for what's a, a mass of seemingly tumor uh, at the time. And so I've had to piece this together of um, what actually happened to me in that, in that time frame. The way I pieced it together was got my family physician's uh, uh, medical records, uh, which were eight by six index cards contained in this little envelope. Um, and that's all the medical records that, that were there you know, for my whole childhood. Uh, he finally closed his practice when I was in medical school uh, and said, here, just take your records. Uh, so I've got those index cards to, to know exactly what happened to me over the, the course of my childhood. So this is going to be the story. Um, I will not be able to see. So you'll see birth weight uh, uh, and so on. Most times it's just weight and height is the, the things as an infant. but. Uh, Lo and behold, as you get to 92266, the, the third column in there, uh, pal feel something palpable in the, uh, the lower abdomen. Um, the swelling is the same, seen back in a couple of weeks. Uh, more vomiting, not keeping food down, something's going on. So the, the test that they could do is called an IVP, intravenous pilogram. Uh, so you get contrast in, it goes through the kidneys, uh, you can see what happens. Um, uh, as it filters through into the, into the urine, into the bladder. So what they see, so they got some x-rays obviously with that, they see a scoliosis of the spine, a swelling in the lower back. Um, the right side seems cystic, um, otherwise it looked negative. Um, something's going on, they get the x-ray of the back in the soft tissue, uh, and in the superior posterior displacement of the right kidney. So something is pushing on the kidney. They admit me to the hospital. This is the admission h &P. Uh, So it's written, no electronic medical records like we have nowadays. Uh, but basically it outlines that, that story of um, mom noticed it's something you know, not going right with the child, feel this, do the IVP, you know, see something pushing on the kidney. Okay, how, how are we gonna take care of it? We're gonna do surgery. Uh, first, uh, they had a couple more tests. They did a venogram. Uh, so it says abdominal mass uh, causing elevation of the right kidney. Uh, scoliosis of the lumbar spine, uh, concavity on the right. They get the consent, uh, so there were, was informed consent back in those days uh, for doing surgery. Uh, my mother signed that. And then uh, they have the um, pathology, uh, and the, this is the operative report, so the findings. So a mass that they could not fully resect, it crossed the midline, it was impinging on uh, the spine itself. Uh, they felt unsafe about trying to fully resect it. Um, um, that's the basic gist of what this says. You can't see it from, from your seats, but uh, suffice to say, they, they took as much as they could. They couldn't get everything. They get the pathology specimen, and uh, it is consistent. The bottom there says neuroblastoma, so uh, clear indication of um, malignancy. Uh, 1966, how are you going to treat uh, neuroblastoma? Um, what they first of all say, so this is the discharge summary, uh, just says, uh, you know, palliative surgery uh, could, not, could not be curative. Um, they're going to be, need to be other things, follow up with your, your physicians. So they decide to do uh, radiation uh, and uh, chemotherapy. And uh, that's the discharge note, uh, just so you can see what it looks like. So for this, uh, this goes back to my cards for my PCP, so it'll document that they were following my VMA level, so we were heard about that. Uh, and then um, these things, vincristin and cy uh, cytoxan uh, given, and so it'll just be the note of how much the dose was, and you get that and you know, continue on. So just a summary, uh, the exploratory laparotomy in October, 
radiation therapy, chemotherapy with vincristin and cytoxan. And uh, seemingly uh, did well. Um, there were you know, some reports uh, along the way of um, some damage from the radiation. Uh, so it looked like it caused pyelectasis uh, on the right side. So I had uh, cyst and hydronephrosis on the right kidney and it totally knocked out uh, my left kidney. So atrophy of the left kidney, uh, that's what this note uh, uh, documents. Um, so no left, left kidney function, totally atrophied, uh, and just working with the right where, where the tumor had been. But beyond that, you know, I got my measles vaccine, I got you know, all the, the other things for childhood, uh, and basically you know, had a regular normal childhood. Um, was told, the story in my family actually, uh, was told that I had a 20% chance of survival uh, uh, when I was diagnosed, uh, and this was a miracle that I, I had you know, survived this. Uh, and so that from, from early age, I said, well, 20%, you know, that's been, you know, I, I survived that. This is my opportunity to dedicate my life to helping others, so that, that idea of becoming a physician in the future uh, was certainly there. Uh, there, there were, you know, things uh, in childhood. Um, I played little league. I, you know, did all the normal things. Uh, did kids did um, um, bully me about my, you know, body, body habitus and my short torso, and so I did have to put up with some of that ridicule. But, but otherwise, had a normal, normal childhood. Except um, at uh, 10 years old. This is a 1970s picture. It looks like the 1970s. This is my mother. Uh, so she. Um, uh, was diagnosed with CML um, in the early 1970s uh, and then died when I was age 10. Uh, so I, I had to deal with uh, the, the loss of my mother. Uh, years later, when I went back to my, uh, my family physician, um, I was getting my physical exam for medical school, and he said, you know, it was probably the radiation uh, that you got, because she had to hold you down for the radiation that may have induced her CML. Um, so I have to you know, deal with the, the story of here's a mother dedicating her life for her son um, that she then you know, died at age 49. So I uh, went on with my life. Um, I did have my spinal problems. Uh, so again, going back to the cards. So there would never be any you know, medical reports from the other doctors. The, my family physician would just have a secretary you know, write down uh, what the report said. Uh, so, if uh, she got a phone call or got interrupted, uh, the bottom of the page here, uh, it says, you know, it was also noted that Mark has been, but she got interrupted and, and, <laughs> and didn't finish the note, uh, so we don't know what, what else uh, was noted. Um, the top part, you know, says that I did have an evaluation of my spine and noted uh, accentuated lordosis and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, for, for, from spinal problems that I'll have to deal with uh, for my life. But uh, life went on. Um, so in the middle picture, you see my father uh, as an older man uh, with his four sons surrounding him, uh, watching him chop the log rather than uh, uh, the kids doing it. Um, but did all the normal things, you know, skied, played tennis, golf, et cetera. Um, did well in school, obviously, to get, get into medical school eventually. Um, and uh, ultimately graduated from, from med school. Uh, my button, my brother gave me, said, uh, trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> um, and then went off uh, to my residency, uh, loading my car down there uh, to go off uh, to do residency in internal medicine. So that's you know, basically where I was gonna end the story. Um, I you know, became the physician that I had thought of you know, when I was a little kid. Um, went about you know, doing my life as a, as a physician. Um, uh, now I've been doing that since 1992 is when I graduated med school. Um, and then uh, a little over 10 years ago, um, around age 40, um, started noticing, so I was on a golf trip uh, with, with uh, buddies and my college roommate noticed when I got in the golf cart to drive the cart, I would lift up my leg. It was something sort of unconsciously done. I, I didn't you know, have any uh, recognition that I was doing it, but he said, well, "Why are you doing that? You know, to get the gas, uh, you know, to get your foot on the gas pedal." Didn't didn't think much of it. Then I started getting fasciculations uh, in my leg, my right leg. Uh, that led ultimately to uh, further evaluation. So they did have MRI at that time. Uh, so I got an MRI, and we'll see if I can use the 
pointer. I'm not sure which one is the pointer. Okay, so just for landmarks, uh, so this is your vertebrae. Uh, over here is your psoas uh, muscle. And for me, uh, my vertebrae is uh, scalloped. And uh, right there is a mass. Uh, so something's going on that's pushing on my nerves uh, coming out of my lumbar spine. Uh, and you know, further evidence of fairly large mass uh, going from L1 to L4 uh, in my psoas muscle uh, affecting all the neural foramina that come out of the vertebrae at that level. More investigation, uh, this shows that I do have this uh, cystic kidney, uh, but then this mass is down here. Uh, pretty abnormal spine, you know, the vertebrae are all collapsed. Um, you know, disc spaces are narrowed, uh, so uh, not, not looking good. Um, so I get a uh, biopsy, so this shows the needle, the sequence of the needle going in uh, for each of these successive ones going right into the, this upside down. Now I'm lying on my stomach. Uh, and so you get the needle in there. And I get the biopsy results. And uh, we just heard about a you know, differentiated tumor. Uh, so well differentiated neurogenic tumor, uh, probably a ganglioneuroma. So I had gone a good 40 years without any symptoms, knew about my kidney issues, knew about my spine issues, but really thought that the tumor was gone. Uh, and lo and behold, it was probably there all the time. Uh, and now it's starting to cause some problems uh, now into my 40s. So, but it's well differentiated. And the question is, what do you do about it? Do you try to take it all out? Do you leave it there, leave well enough to be? Uh, we did some further studies. I got a PET scan. Uh, this is hard to see, but uh, it does show some metabolic activity. Um, so a low-grade tumor, slowly growing, Again, probably been there for, for 40 years at that point. Um, doesn't seem to be a radiation-induced sarcoma was the other possibility, but the biopsy showed more, more likely a ganglioneuroma. So I saw a neurosurgeon. You could do surgery. But that's going to, given your spine, given the extent of the tumor, uh, going to require fairly you know, sophisticated hardware to, to put in. Uh, knowing how my spine looked, uh, to put you know, metal into that didn't seem like a too good idea. Um, there was also concern, you know, if you start going into uh, that area, there are lots of uh, vital structures, uh, uh, gonadal uh, veins, sympathetic uh, nerve chain, uh, other things that uh, might be important to, to, to have using uh, that, that you want to make sure they're working. Uh, so the other possibility is, well, could you do something like radiation? Uh, just try to define it. Again, the issue is going to be, um, uh, is it is it uh, metabolically active enough that radiation could really work? Um, so I, you know, way, way too much information. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, asked all the, the consultants I saw, so what would you do? You know, what would you do in this situation? And they said, think about your options, you know, think about it carefully and, you know, come up with a good decision. <laughs> Nobody ever really gave a good recommendation, just sort of left me to, to make the decision. Maybe because I was a physician, maybe because I, studied the literature myself. But that, that, that experience informed me, you know, so now I teach medical students, I, I teach medical ethics, uh, and so it really makes me, you know, very cognizant of the fact that we need to give good information to people, we need to give a recommendation, give an opinion about the information we're giving to, to uh, patients and families, uh, and really try to instill that in, in the students I teach. So life goes on, you know, I continue to lead an active life, um, a busy clinical practice, um, uh, go you know, all over the world uh, traveling. I uh, have a you know, rich and varied life. Um, played golf. Uh, my, my father considered me the ringer. He moved down to Florida eventually. Uh, I was the ringer to go down and play in golf tournaments uh, for him. Um, we had the rainbow uh, for one, one of our excursions. Uh, and uh, what do I do now? Um, so I'm just following my tumor. Uh, it causes right leg weakness. Uh, I have a little bit of a limp uh, when I walk, um, but me and the tumor are just getting along just fine. I, I follow it every few years. I got an MRI last year, um, showed that it might, you know, relatively stable, um, still there, but pushing on all the nerves, um, and I just try to, uh, to deal with it. 
My other medical issues, uh, just for those that do ask about lo sort of long-term survival, what do you have to worry about? So hypertension, because I've got the kidney issues. I'm now in stage four, uh, chronic kidney disease. You know, stage five is when you start needing dialysis, so that might be on my horizon in the next few years. Uh, interestingly, from the endocrine talk this morning, uh, I did have thyroiditis uh, in my mid-30s. Uh, that then burnt out my, my thyroid, so I have hypothyroidism. I'm on thyroid hormone replacement. Um, so there are the, those sort of chronic issues that I deal with. And then there's always this, too. well, sometimes it helps to turn the question around, why not you? <laughs> um, and the, the answer for that, for me, is coming to a meeting like this. So you've seen snapshots of my life. Um, uh, I see this as a snapshot in, in my, my life story. Um, the opportunity both, you know, uh, eight or nine years ago as well as today uh, to come share some hope with you that, yes, you can have long-term survival. Um, this idea that I had a 20% chance and, and made it. So whoever saves one life, you know, as if you saved the entire world. Uh, that's, that's the motto I live by, that I want to try to give to others um, to give them that hope. Um, my mother, when, when I, we weren't actually told that she had leukemia. Uh, so I was a young kid, you know, uh, before age 10, um, when she was dealing with her CML, uh, and then eventually went into a blast crisis and, and, and died of it. Uh, but on our refrigerator, growing up as a kid, she had a poem, uh, and that maybe gave her the inspiration uh, each day. So I'm just gonna share the, the first and last stanzas of that, um, because uh, I, I think it's helpful for you all, uh, regardless of your spir spiritual beliefs. Uh, God hath not promised skies always blue, flower-strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God hath promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. So, thank you all. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. <clears throat> Again, giving the inspiration. It, it truly, everyone needs it. I'll tell you that right now. Thank